Our next speaker is Elia Chipman. He completed his PhD at the Hebrew University in Evolution of Amphibian Development. During his postdoctoral work at Cambridge, he switched to focus on different approaches to the study of the evolution of the anthropod body plan. And he's currently an associate professor at the Hebrew University. The paper we'll be delivering today is titled Serial Homology and Segmental Identities in Anthropod Development and Evolution. Hi, how are you doing? Um, it's 6.15 p.m. My brain usually switches off at 6. No, um, no, no. <laughs> third, third speaker in a session at the end of the long day, we're an hour and a half since the last coffee break. So my challenge is to keep you awake for the next 35 minutes. I was thinking of doing a song and dance routine, but decided instead to tell you an interesting story and show pretty pictures. Uh, hopefully this will work. Uh, so I'll, I'll start, of course, by thanking Ute. Uh, for inviting me, this is I think the third, maybe fourth time I've spoken in one of these meetings. Uh, and actually I met Eric Davison at these meetings and even had the pleasure of hosting him on a, on a walking tour, or not walking, he had this, this uh, scooter thing, um, the old city of Jerusalem, uh, eight, nine, ten years ago, I don't remember. Uh, the subject of this workshop actually fits my interests perfectly, because what I've really been interested in for years is this balance between change and stability in evolution. Why do some things remain the same, whereas other things change? And partially influenced by Eric and also by, by Doug Irwin's work, I've been shifting towards the gene regulatory network view of evolution. So, so pretty much the title of this workshop summarizes what I'm interested in doing. And specifically, I'm interested in the evolution of the arthropod body plan. And arthropods are fantastic animals to work on because they're so diverse. But they're diverse with a conserved body plan. So all of arthropods are variation on a theme. So the question of why is this theme conserved on the, other, on the one hand, and how do variations on this theme drive the diversity of arthropods are, are both fascinating questions. And what I'll try and do is, is answer some sub-questions within this huge question of, of diversity and plasticity, uh, focusing on the question of, of segment identity. Uh, and touching on, on philosophical questions of homology and serial homology. So starting with, with the basic idea of segmentation. So segmentation is both a developmental process and a morphological phenomenon. And the morphological phenomenon is the repetition of complex units, and the stress here is on complex units, not simple units, along the anterior-posterior axis. And the process of segmentation is the developmental process that generates the morphological phenomenon of segmentation. And we can study the evolution of the phenomenon by looking at the development and the evolution of the developmental uh, pathway. And if we look at the body of an arthropod, these segments, these repeated units, are, in a sense, the same. So they're repeats of the same thing, or we would say they're homologous or serially homologous. And I wanted to try and delve into those concepts a bit before continuing. And I will call on, on um, Günther Wagner here. And Günther Wagner and Eric Davidson did not agree on everything. Uh, but there are, some, there are some themes that they had in common. And one of them is the idea of, of gene regulatory networks as important factors in evolution. Uh, and Günther wrote a very long and dense book on homology, which I can say I read um, from beginning to end. But this is not from that book, but this is from a later paper. And he talks about several different concepts of homology. So there's the, the basic intuitive common concept of homology as sameness. So two structures are homologous if they're the same. And that's the Owenian concept of all structures in their diversity of form and function, or whatever the exact phrasing is. So structures that are the same are homologous. Then there's the evolutionary idea of homology that structures are homologous if they have a, an evolutionary continuity. They derive from a common ancestor and are all variations on the same structure that came from a common ancestor. And Gunther's own contribution to this idea is the idea of character identity networks, or chains. So two structures or characters are homologous if they are formed through the same character identity network. And this is, this is the... the um, this is the definition that I'll most work on. I'll, I'll ignore this. This has to do with co-option and reuse of networks. So, so leave this aside, even though it's on the slide, and I won't come back to it uh, even later. So, so let's talk about these three different concepts. Uh, 
And let's talk a bit about the idea of serial homology. So if we try and understand serial homology using the concepts that I just introduced, so all of these segments in the centipede are the same. So they meet the criterion of sameness. Uh, in the sense that they all have this pair of appendages, they have a pterygite and a sternite, and they have a, a, um, elements of the nervous system and muscles, etc. So they're serially homologous in the sense of being the same. But do they have a shared ancestry? Well, obviously not, because they're in the same organism. So we can't really talk about them having an ancestor that is common. So there isn't an ancestor that's common to this segment and this segment. But if we use the character identity network concept, we can ask the question of whether these segments are formed through a similar developmental process. And if they are, we can say that, well, at least two out of three criteria, we can call these structures homologous or, or serially homologous segments in this case because they're in the same organism. So centipede is easy. But if we look at this uh, crayfish, the segments are not quite as the same as they are in the centipede. And if we look at the spider, it's even more confusing. Because can we say that this abdominal segment here is in any way homologous to this leg-bearing segment here? So these are interesting questions. Uh, just as an aside, serial homology is not only relevant to repeating structures like segments. Feathers in a bird are all, sorry, are all serially homologous structures in the sense they're all formed through the same pattern and network and they all have the same general structure uh, so serial homology is not just repeating units in sequence, it can also be repeating units across an animal. So this, the idea of, of segmentation is the, the stability part, the sameness part. Uh, the plasticity part comes when we start talking about tagmatization. So if you look at an arthropod, as I showed in the previous slide, the segments are not all the same. The segments are arranged in functional units known as tagmata, uh, so in a spider, a pelicerate, they're arranged into an epistosome and a prosoma, and in insects, famously, they're arranged into an abdomen, thorax, and head. And each one of these pragmata is made up of several segments. And the question, sort of silly question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, so are segments serially homologous across pragmata? So is a segment in the abdomen homologous to a segment in the thorax homologous to a segment in the head? The obvious answer is yes but it's not that trivial when you go into details. Let's talk a bit about the process of segmentation and what we know from diversity of arthropods. Usually, the Evo Devo literature talks about two main ways of creating segments. One is the Drosophila paradigm, which everybody knows, everybody studied. It's probably one of the best studies, if not the best studied developmental process in biology, um, as we heard in the previous slide. And in Drosophila segmentation, which is also known as long-term segmentation or simultaneous segmentation, all of the segments are formed more or less simultaneously, not exactly simultaneously, but pretty much together through a hierarchical network that breaks down the embryo into smaller and smaller units until ultimately we have segment-sized units um, at the, the segment polarity stage. So I'm not sure how many hours that is, I think 20 hours into development or something like that. Uh, and this is divided into several stages, hierarchical stages, each one of which activates the stage after it. But this is a bit of a simplification because there are a lot of interactions and cross-regulation between the different stages. And this is part of the gene regulatory network that's involved in, in this entire sequence. So this is the most, this is the best known, but by far not the most common way of making segments. In fact, the more common way of making segments in all arthropods, not just in insects, is what's known as sequential segmentation. The term short-term development uh, is very common in the literature, but it's a bit of a misnomer because short-term development actually referred to something else in the original paper. So I'll, I'll leave the term here, but I will use the term sequential segmentation mostly. So in sequential segmentation, segments are formed more elegantly than in Drosophila. They're formed through a repeating pattern which is superficially similar to the segmentation clock that Denis talked about, but only superficially, these are not homologous processes, but similar to the segmentate to the vertebrate segmentation clock, in that there's a posterior zone, it's known as the growth zone or the segment addition zone, uh, uh, in which there is a pattern that repeats itself, a series of interacting genes that activate each other in some kind of loop. Uh, to give the same structure, again, the same structure that is serially homologous structure, again and again throughout 
out of segmentation. The best model for this is the red flower beetles, Fibrillum castanellum, but many other arthropods do the same. And this is probably the ancestral primitive mode of generating segments in arthropods in general. Now, we all know that in biology, whenever you present a dichotomy, there's an either or. The answer is always both, or at least there's some <laughs> examples of both. Uh, and in fact, many systems, many insects specifically, and probably other arthropods, do a bit of both. So uh, anterior segments are formed in the blastoderm simultaneously in a drosophila-like way, and posterior segments are formed sequentially from this growth zone or segment addition zone through this repeating process uh, that we just saw. And the favorite model species in my lab for the past 15 years has been this critter over here, Ophipelsus fasciatus. It's a bug in the biological sense, not in the sense of an ugly thing that walks along your kitchen floor. Uh, it is a mypter in a bug, a seed bug. It eats on, lives on sunflower seeds. It's probably the easiest animal to keep in the lab that I've ever come across. Uh, and in the development of the milkweed bug, as I said, the anterior segments are formed in a very drosophila blastoderm like way, and the posterior segments are formed through a segmentation flock. For the past, I'm afraid to say this, but for the past 15 years, my lab has been working on this animal, and we've pretty much dissected, not in as much detail, of course, as is known in for drosophila, but we've dissected many elements, both of this process and of this process, and we have a fairly good understanding of what's happening and where it's similar to drosophila and where it's different from drosophila. I want to go off on a bit of a tangent now. Uh, so for me, one of the most positive outcomes of these meetings was, I think three or four years ago, uh, in one of these meetings, I had a chat with Isabel Peters. And following that chat, she invited me to contribute a chapter uh, to um, a volume of current topics of developmental biology on gene regulatory networks, which many of you here were also involved in. Uh, and I wrote this chapter which was on the evolution of the Drosophila blastoderm network. So what I did is I took the blastoderm network and I broke it down into many constituent networks, many sub-networks. And then, using the literature, what's known from other arthropods, I reconstructed where in evolution each one of these elements of the network appeared. So what we know of, what we think of, of as a single complex network is actually made up of different networks with different evolutionary histories. Most famously, um, Bicoid, which is the best studied morphogen, is actually a novelty that evolved in a specific family of flies. So it's not even fly specific, it's Drosophila and cousin specific. But I want to focus on this stage. This is the segment polarity network, which I will argue is the character identity network of segmentation. It is the network that is the most conserved. It evolved with the evolution of arthropods, with the evolution of segmentation in arthropods. It's not found in other bilaterians, non-segmented bilaterians. And the segment polarity network is involved in defining every segment in every arthropod ever studied, with a small exception that I'll talk about in a few minutes. So the segment polarity network, I will argue, is the character identity network, is what defines a segment and makes different segments serially homologous to each other. Going back to Oncopeltis, there is an interesting phenomenon in Oncopeltis that's been staring us in the face, or that had been staring us in the face for years and somehow never clicked until recently. So I said that some segments are formed simultaneously and some segments are formed sequentially, <coughs> but I did not stress that the some segments that are formed simultaneously in the blastoderm are the nasal segments and the thoracic segments and the segments that are formed sequentially in the germ band are the abdominal segments. So this transition between thorax and abdomen is not just a morphological transition between tegmata, it's also a developmental transition. So something different, something fundamentally different is happening in the way segments are generated between thoracic and nasal segments and abdominal segments. And this was one of these things, one of these eureka moments that wait a minute, why did I never see the importance of this? And I presented this at a conference, uh, and somebody said, well, that's not the Peltis thing. You know, it's, it's not conserved, it's, it's a coincidence, it's because of the way Peltis develops. Uh, so we decided to take this further and try and think about what actually drives segmentization. Another tangent. <laughs> 
about two months ago, I was in Lausanne and I gave a talk. Uh, and somebody came up to me at the end of the talk and said, it's a good thing Denis de Boulle didn't come from Geneva because he wouldn't have liked what you just said. <laughs> um, so I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, trigger warning. Uh, this has to do with segmentization. If you ask most developmental biologists what drives segmentization in arthropods, the answer will be Hox genes. But if you actually look at the borders of Hox genes in different arthropods, this is from a classic review from already 20 years ago, none of the expression borders of Hox genes actually overlap segmental borders. Not as elegantly as you would want them to if really Hox genes were, were driving segmentization. And just as, a, as an example, this is a really poor staining. Uh, but this is abdominal B, I think, uh, which is supposed to mark the border between thorax and abdomen, but it's not actually at the border. It's half a segment posterior to the border. So clearly, this is not what is driving segmentization. It's maybe a later element um, that, that adds details. In that talk in Lausanne, I may have also said the toxins are overrated. I won't repeat that here. Um, but that may have been what, what uh, drove that comment. So what is driving pigmentization? And going back to what I said before, it's this difference between two different developmental processes in the same embryo. And looking at just one gene, this is even skip, which is one of the classic Drosophila segmentation genes, it has three phases of expression in octopelsis. It has an early phase where it's expressed in the posterior two-thirds of the blastoderm, it has a later phase where it's expressed in single segments, not double segments. There is no perial periodicity in octopelsis development, aside. So it's expressed in single segments corresponding to the nasal segments and the thoracic segments during the blastoderm stage. And then it's expressed dynamically in a repeating process from the growth zone during later stages. So if we look, um, I'm repeating myself just to drive this point in. If we look at how the different segments are formed, and now we're looking at a, a medium germ-bound embryo stained, not for even skip, but for engrailed, I think, a segmental marker. So these segments, which look the same at this stage, arose through simultaneous segmentation, and these segments arose through sequential segmentation, and these segments rose through a process known as splitting, which I'll put aside from now, for now, but I'll come back to it in a few minutes. So this is true for octopelis. But what's happening in other insects? So we started by doing a literature search, and we found this paper um, from Willis to Cricket from 2004, which describes segmentation in the Cricket. And even though they don't point this out in the text, if you look at the figure legend and look at their images, there is a gap between the formation of the third thoracic segment, T3 here. So the first, all of these segments come up very rapidly. Then there's a gap, there's a break, and only after a while do the abdominal segments start coming up. So in another species, there's a difference between thoracic and abdominal segmentation. So we decided to adopt another species. We started working on the German cockroach, or as I said to someone earlier today or yesterday, nobody would use the term cute to define cockroaches, uh, but they are a useful model organism because they're fairly easy to keep in the lab. Uh, they have really bizarre embryos because they, they develop in an egg case, sort of staggered, and they look like watermelon slices. So it's a sort of two-dimensional embryo with a bottom bit difficult to figure out initially. This is from a 1970s paper describing the morphology of their development, and this is our work from student Oren Maros Lavoy, uh, who's standing here for hedgehog, a segmentation gene. This is looking at the embryo from the side, the same orientation, but we can also dissect the germ band uh, and look at it and trace the dynamics of segmentation. Uh, we haven't finished analyzing these data, so it is actually writing up her thesis as we speak. But from looking at her data, from looking at the expression of even skip and other segmentation genes, there is a different dynamic between the nasal thoracic segments and the abdominal segments. The different dynamic is different to the different dynamic we see in Alcapeltis, but there are still two distinct mechanisms patterning nasal thoracic segments as opposed to abdominal segments. So I, I think there's something real here, that there actually is a developmental boundary that corresponds to a morphological boundary. So what is our model for insect for the determination of tagmana? So we suggest a two-phase model for tagmanization. The first phase uh, has distinct and temporally separate segmentation mechanisms for the nasal thoracic and the abdominal segment. So as the segments are first formed, they're already different before anything is overlaid on them. 
The second phase is overlaying tagging specific structures. And this is where Hox genes come in. So Hox genes are not only Hox genes, but several other late patterning genes which take the segments that already know that they're abdominal segments or thoracic segments and adds tagging specific and segment specific structures. Going back to my original question, the segment polarity network, the segmental character identity network is the same. So despite the fact that these segments are patterned differently and they have different identities, they are severely homologous. The, the, the segment polarity network is conserved among pegmata. So with all these differences, they're still the same. But, there's a but here. What about the head? So I've been talking about the nasal thoracic segments, but I've been ignoring the three anterior segments of the head. And if we look at the um, structure or the development of an insect head, the insect head is actually made up of six segments. I've been talking about three of them and ignoring the anterior three. So the three segments are the three nasal segments. These are the, seg these are the segments that have the mouth part. I told you my brain is switched off. Um, the three anterior segments are the ocular segment, which has the eyes, and the antennal segment, which has the antenna, and the intercalary segment, which in crustaceans has another antenna, but in insects is basically a missing segment. It's an appendage of the segment. It's been known for a long time that these three anterior segments, which are known as the procephalon, or sometimes the prenatal segments, are different in some way or other. And there's Drosophila work on this from the 90s. But if you read those papers, what they always say is these segments are different because of the different morphology of the anterior sense, sense organs. Nobody ever really asked the question, is there an evolutionary significance to the difference between the prenatal segments and the other head segments? If you look at the diversity of arthropods, you see that these three prenatal segments are actually a conserved structure found in all four classes of arthropods. There are three segments, the anterior segments of the body, not always of the head, because chalicerates don't have a real head for chalicerates. Chalicerates don't have a real head. But the three anterior segments of the body have three gray neuropile. So they have three ganglia that together make up the brain, make up the brain. And these are probably homologous among the, the, the four um, arthropod classes. So the, the prenatal segments and the head and the brain and the structures they innervate are homologous across across are homologous across arthropod classes. And what I'm leading to, they are very different from all the other segments. Why do we say that? So I've already said that I would come back to this splitting idea. The three anterior segments, the three prenatal segments, are not patterned similarly to any of the other segments. There are several genes, specifically hedgehog, which is one of the segment polarity genes, which is not expressed in stripes, but is expressed in a single stripe that then splits once or twice to give three stripes. And we see this, or other people have shown this, in insects from our work, in centipedes, and in spiders. So there's something conserved and different from all other segments. There's this stage of hedgehog stripe splitting that's unusual. And the question we ask, going back to what we talked about before, is the segment polarity network conserved in the formation of the prenatal segments, the PGS. Uh, just a quick reminder, or, or it's not a reminder to those of you who don't know, the segment polarity network is a fairly simple network. It's made up of three, maybe four genes, depending how you count. The interactions between them, the spatial, um, spatial spacing between them, it's very conserved, as I said, in all arthropods, in all segments, except. So we wanted to ask that except question. Are they really conserved? Is their interaction conserved? Is the network conserved in the prenatal segments? So Owen Lev, a PhD student in the lab, took this on as his project, and I won't go through all the details. I'll just run you through, through the bottom line. So we looked first at wild-type expression of these segments, and even without going into too many details. So hedgehog, there's the difference that it splits in the prenatal segments where it doesn't split in other segments. If you look at the expression of wingless, for example, so this is wingless in the prenatal segments in these patches. This is wingless in all the other segments. This is hedgehog. Hedgehog and wingless juxtaposed in all of the segments. They're not even expressed in the same place in the prenatal segments. So in terms of spatial patterning, in terms of the spatial interactions between the segment polarity genes in the prenatal segments, they're not the same. Oh, and then went on 
to knock out each one of these genes and look at the expression of the other genes to try and figure out the network and see how they interact and how they correspond to each other. Cut a long story short, the interactions are different. So the specific interactions, the network, the gene regulatory network patterning the prenatal segments is different to that of all the other segments. Which leads us to this very provocative, but I think almost obvious statement that the prenatal segments do not share a character identity network with trunk segments, and therefore they cannot be considered serial homologs. So, in fact, we almost went as far, but, but stopped just short, of saying that we should not be calling them segments. They're prenatal structures, but they're not segments because they're different in so many ways. So, going back to, to Gunther Wagner's idea, so, they're different in the sense of sameness. They're different in the sense of character identity networks. What can we say about continuity? And for that, for that, we go to the arthropod fossil record, and nothing better to end it off than show some pictures of cool fossils. Uh, so I spent seven years ago, I spent a sabbatical with Doug at the Smithsonian, where I taught myself Cambrian paleontology and learned all about um, these cool pre-arthropod fossils. Uh, in a series of papers alone and together with Greg Edgecombe, a paleontologist from the Natural History Museum, we've been developing the idea of how you can use the fossil record together with developmental biology to look at the early evolution of arthropods. And this is from a paper with Greg Edgecombe from a couple of years ago, three years ago already. So for those of you who don't know the paleontolog paleontological evolutionary terminology, what we're seeing here is a tree that includes extant arthropods at the top of the tree and various fossil taxa down here, and all of these taxa here are what are known as stem group arthropods. So these are arthropods that do not share a common ancestor, these are species, sorry, that do not share a common ancestor with all extant arthropods. And if you look at the sequence of fossils going up the tree towards the crown, for the crown is all the arthropods, that, all the species that share a common ancestor with arthropods, if you move up the stem group towards the crown, you see the gradual addition of arthropod-specific structures, or arthropod synapomorphies. So by looking at these fossils, we can see the sequence of events that lead to the body plan of extant arthropods. And I will focus mostly on what is known as the lower stem groups of these animals here, uh, in this beautiful uh, picture that I stole off the internet. This is not a fossil arthropod. This is a uh, so these are the animals I'll be look, talking about, mostly the, a group known generally as logopods. They include things like Animalocaris, which is very well known, and the, the bizarre and wonderful Opabinia. I'll specifically focus today on this animal here, Lyrorapax, and where is it? Turigmukila, this animal over here, which are both lower stem group arthropods, so are the lower species in the lower stem of arthropods, so relatives of arthropods that do not have the complete arthropod body plan. In fantastically preserved fossils of Lyrorapax and several other species, we can find remains of neural tissue, which allows us to reconstruct the structure of, these, of the brain of these animals. And both Lyrorapax and Perigmachila, which are lowest stem group animals, have a head and a brain that's made up of a single segment. So a single neuromere, a single segment, a single pair of appendages at the anterior. That is the entire head of these stem group animals. Moving a bit further up the stem to animals like this beautiful Fushien Hoya and um, Megakaira, which uh, the animals on my t-shirt um, are belong to the Megakaira. So these animals, which are higher up, close to the crown, and some people even put them in the crown, have a segment, have a head that's made up of three segments with three neuromeres. So three seg a three-part brain, three segments. Most models for the evolution of the arthropod head will say we have a head with a single segment, and then two segments were recruited from the trunk to form the three-segment head. But if these three segments of the brain are the prenatal segments, and they are not serial homologs of the trunk segments, the head, the three-segment head, cannot have evolved by recruitment of trunk segments. And we made, again, the controversial claim, which took us a very long time to publish, but finally came out two weeks ago. We made the claim that the arthropod prenatal segments evolved by a splitting, and this echoes the molecular splitting we see in hedgehog. So the splitting of an original single segment to give a modern three-segment head, 
And then the insect head then adds on three trunk segments. So the nasal segments are actually our trunk segments that have been added to the head later. But the original, the anterior three segments, the prenatal segments, at this point in the tree, or sorry, at this point in the tree, the single segment, which we mark here in green, expands, triplicates, splits, use whatever term you want, to give three segments that are marked in three different shades of green uh, to indicate that they share the same ancestry. So these are, to borrow a term from molecular evolution, these segments are paralogs of each other. So they're all derived from the splitting of an original segment. And not going into all the morphological details, this actually solves a lot of other problems in early arthropod evolution, uh, having to do with, with the position of appendages and, and sense organs, etc. So I'll summarize um, all the ideas that I've brought up here. So first of all, trunk segments are also really homologous. Um, the segment polarity network is the common and conserved element of the segmentation process, the character identity network. Segment identity within the trunk, within these serially homologous segments, may be determined or possibly determined very early via differences in segment generation, different processes of, of segmentation. And the prenatal segments, in contrast to all the other segments, do not share the conserved network and have a distinct evolutionary history from time to trunk segments. I want to steal two minutes from the question time just to introduce my lab and, and introduce some of the other projects going on in my lab very briefly. Don't throw things at me. Uh, so most of the work I showed today was done by Owen Lev, the student over here. Uh, he's also now doing work looking at, um, at control regions and enhancer regions, trying to knock out enhancer regions that drive segmentation of even skipped in the sequential segmentation and simultaneous segmentation to try and, and see the differences there. Uh, so that's Owen's work. Owen was on maternity leave when this photo was taken. So Owen is another student who was doing the segmentation work in the cockroach. Uh, Owen Balev, who was here and will be here again tomorrow but had to leave, is working on even earlier development of the cockroach. All kinds of questions of the evolution of the blastoderm. Really crazy stuff. Um, Nitsan, who's also here, is working over there. Uh, is working on the on the development of the brain in the three prenatal segments in early segment in early insect development to try and see how these brain segments are different from other brain segments and also think about the evolution of holometaboly. The question of the evolution of holometaboly from hemimetaboly forms the focus of the work of Judy Wexler here, who's also working on very on the evolution of various other networks uh, and the evolution of Thorax, etc. So she has, she's a postdoc. She has seven different projects. Uh, another project in the lab, which I haven't mentioned at all, is on the evolution of uh, of molting, which is a project funded by the Swiss Natural Science Foundation, which is why I was in Lausanne two months ago. And uh, Olga Volovich is a postdoc on that project. Um, Idan is a PhD student on that project, and Asia here is a technician on that project. Um, and this is. Mila, my lab technician, who keeps everything together. Um, and of course, Greg Edgecombe, uh, who was involved in the whole fossil side of the evolution of the head. Thank you. I think I have time for that. one. I, uh, I'm not sure I understood what, what you mean by segmentalization. Can you give a simple definition of this? Of what? Segmentalization. So Can you I say that? So I'm talking about segmentation and then segment identity. And I'm, I'm not sure what, what term you're asking about. Okay, because I thought I had understood. So I'm talking about tagmatization. Okay, so I wrongly understood. So what you meant is that you doubt about the function of heart genes in segmental identity. In the early stages of segmental identity. Okay. But what, I, what I'm saying is that the early stages of segmental identity are in the very early process of segmentation, whereas then Hox genes go over with a paintbrush and, and add on the details that, that make the segments different. Yeah. So how do you um, how do you integrate into this um, the um, ground state mutation of Gary's tool where he's totally removed the Hox genes and got a good collection of you know homologous segments? That's that's a good point because I think like in many mutations there's a lot of crosstalk. So one of the things we're trying to get at, and, and we're not really there yet, so this is the working hypothesis that we now have to prove, uh, 
heart genes, at least in insects, appear too late to really be defining what's a, a nasal, what's a nasal thoracic abdominal segment, etc. But there must be a lot of crosstalk, and I'm sure that even if their early determination is correct, and then you knock out the Hox genes, you still mess up the identity that's been determined before. So, so there's a lot of crosstalk and, and back and forth in between different stages and different patterning systems. So that's my pop out for explaining uh, how, how that fits with our model. So a lot of the massive mutations are so significant that they mess up everything, and, and it's really difficult to, to tease out exactly what that specific mutation is doing. Uh, The upstream network is different, different, yes. You know, it's not even completely different because the same genes are there, but the dynamics are different. The timing, the interactions are different, but it, it is the same gene, so I didn't put that slide up, but we actually have a slide where we show that the sequence of genes involved in sequential segmentation is exactly the same as the sequence of genes in, in simultaneous segmentation. So in terms of what gene is activated, which, they're the same genes. But the dynamics and the precise timing and the cellular environment are different. And you think that both the, what, the, 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 I don't remember which one, oh, the, the frontal one that appeared uh, simultaneously in the one, which one of them is more ancestral or both of them? The, the sequential is ancestral, that's pretty clear. So the sequential segmentation is what we see in centipedes. So centipedes, yeah, yeah, all the segments are patterned sequentially. But don't you see this, um, the, the one that is uh, simultaneous, don't you see all the examples that you showed also? Uh, we don't have enough data about enough species. Uh, what we claimed in another paper is that sequential, the simultaneous segmentation appears somewhere at the, in hemimetabolous insects and takes over and does everything in Drosophila. But originally it just patterns the thorax. But, but we don't have enough data points. There are a lot of holes in there. I'm just struck, this is perhaps a sort of an expanding out kind of type of question, but I'm really struck by the way the, the front of the head is made by non-conventional mechanisms, both in your um, insects, so many of them, and also in uh, vertebrates. Yes, there's actually there's a paper crest. from, um, what's his name? Rome. Um, Rome? Mm, well, yes, but, but uh, uh, no, more recent. Um, Spanish guy in uh, Seville, um, forgetting his name, Jaime uh, Bogunia. So I a paper comparing head development in vertebrates and in arthropods, and he claims that there's something, that there's an ancestral head, which I would say is the single segment of the arthropod and the protocerebrum of vertebrates. Yeah. So I answered your question yeah. before you finish asking. Yeah. So there's but, absolutely yeah. no, there's no homology at all in the processes by which you make a head from neural crest and the way you make a head no. from from this. No, 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 it's no, still no. it's still a need to make a head. Yes. Yeah. I finally figured out those were the instruments. So that I was wondering if it was someone's cell phone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you.